And we are going to start, and thank you for coming. This is really very important uh, presentations by Dr. Marshall. And at the same time, this is something very important for our renewal of license. This CNE course meets the Texas Board of Nursing mandatory CNE requirements and contain information related to the Texas Nursing Practice Act, the board's rules, including number 217.11 of this title, which relates to the standards of nursing practice, the board's position statements, principles of nursing ethics, and professional boundaries. As I said, this is a CNE which provides you with 2.0 contact hours. Having said that, you must attend the entire program, complete the program evaluation that we will provide you by a Survey Monkey link after the program, and we will email that to you. There is no conflict of interest that has been identified in providing this continuing nursing education activity. And this is very important. The University of Texas Medical Branch Continuing Nursing Education is an approved provider of continuing nursing education by the Texas Nurses Association and an, an accredited approver by the American Nurses Credentialing Center Commission on Accreditation. This nursing ethics uh, presentation a uh, nursing ethics seminar is organized and facilitated by the Nursing Education Advancement and Resources and the Institute of the Medical Humanities. Uh, before I introduce our uh, uh, speaker, I would like to acknowledge all the people or all the uh, facilities that are with us. Uh, the locations that we have are uh, the OBGYN uh, Administration, Engleton Danbury Center, Town Center, uh, Regional Maternal Child Health in Katy and in Beaumont. We have Victory Lakes. We have Lake City PD and Family Medicine. We have Texas City Primary Adult and Specialty Areas and other areas that are able to do uh, broadcast live from their particular areas. Uh, By the way, this is being videotaped so that for your colleagues that are not available here today, we will have a learner-paced uh, educational activity that will be available to them. All right? So, I would like to introduce our featured speaker for today, Dr. David Marshall. Dr. David Marshall currently serves as you can have my seat when you get it. patient care services officer for UTMB Health. He has begun his association here at UTMB since 1983, and he starts as a staff nurse and advanced to uh, many positions here from assistant head nurse, nurse manager, nursing supervisor, nursing administration, and director of nursing. And in 2001, he assumed the role of Chief Nursing Officer. He has also holds an appointment as an adjunct associate professor at the UTMB School of Nursing since 2001. He earned his Bachelor's of Science degree in nursing from University of Texas in Austin and his Master's of Science in Nursing from University of Texas Medical Branch in Galveston. And he graduated from South Texas College of Law in 1993 and at the same time, on 2013, he completed his uh, Doctor of Nursing Practice at Texas Tech Health Science Center in uh, Lubbock, Texas. We are graced to have Dr. David Marshall here with us. We are very grateful that he is here to share his expertise in nursing jurisprudence and ethics. And the title of our presentation is Staying Off the Edge with the Texas Board of Nursing. I give you Dr. David Marshall. Thanks, Mary Bell. Good afternoon, everyone who's here, everyone who's joining remotely, and everyone who's watching by videotape in the future. It's always hard to sit there and listen to someone talk about 
what you've done over a 32-year career. It doesn't seem like it's been that long. And I should have done more, it seems like. <laughs> oh, everyone always asks what the initials behind my name stand for. So D JD is Doctor of Jurisprudence. DNP is Doctor of Nursing Practice. RN, you guys know. CEMP, Certified Executive Nursing Practice. And NEABC is Nurse Executive Advanced Board Certified. And I'm trying to seek one more credential. I think I'm going to get my co concealed handgun license so I can <laughs> put CHL after there. <laughs> on my business card, it will probably be on the back. So these are our objectives for today, to look at the nurse's duty to provide safe, competent care to patients and the Texas Board of Nurses' role in protecting the welfare of the people of Texas to incorporate the principles of nursing ethics and professional boundaries into pr current practice, and to integrate the standards for nursing practice into current practice and distinguish the types, the two different types of peer review. Does that sound okay? Is that what you're here for? Yes. Standing room only crowd. I know it's the topic, not the speaker. <laughs> so here's a disclaimer. Although I'm an attorney, this information is not legal advice and I'm not acting as your attorney. I'm not making any claims or promises or guarantees that what I'm going to tell you today is accurate, complete, or adequate, um, and that you can't rely on the information in this presentation as an alternative to legal advice from your attorney or other professional legal, legal services provider. Okay? All right. Just as long as you know everything I say may not be right. <laughs> so what is jurisprudence? Does anybody know? It's really the science or the philosophy of law. So I have a doctor of jurisprudence, which is the study of the science or the philosophy of law. And ethics, what is that? It's, this definition may be a little different than what you usually think of it as, but it's really um, distinguishing from what's good from what's bad and tying that with moral duty and obligation. And I think that's the way the board wants nurses to think of ethics and the way that they anticipated the rule that they added. So in April of 2014, in this little document that comes out to you frequently from the Board of Nurse Examiners, I know you probably all do like I do and look to see that your name's not in there. <laughs> and that centerfold section, and then the next thing you do is look for people you know. Is, it, <laughs> is that what everybody does? <laughs> or people that you don't want to know? Anyway, in April 2014, the Board of Nursing Bulletin contained the new and updating continuing nursing education requirements, which included the requirement for nursing jurisprudence and ethics, and then the requirement for geriatric care of the older adult. If you go onto the Board of Nurses website, they have a little calculator that you can put in the uh, date of your the expiration of your license, and it will calculate when you're supposed to have completed the nursing jurisprudence and ethics course, and then also the geriatric <laughs> course. I think you have to complete the geriatric course every renewal cycle, and then the nursing jurisprudence and ethics, I think it's within every three cycles. Three cycles, right? Three cycles. So the requirements are that all nurses have to complete at least two contact hours in nursing jurisprudence and ethics prior to the end of every third licensure renewal cycle. The contact hours have to be approved as CNE, and the requirement can't be met through national nursing certification. The course has to contain the following information. It has to contain information about the Texas Nurse Practice Act, the board's rules, including Rule 217.11, the standards of nursing practice, the board's position statements, the principles of nursing ethics, and information about professional boundaries. So why are, we, why are we concerned with this information? Why do you think the board decided that all nurses in Texas should have a course on nursing jurisprudence and ethics? Well, I think one of the reasons is that there's a standard that's applicable to all nurses in the standards of nursing practice that says that nurses have to know and conform to the Texas Nurse Practice Act, the board's rules and regulations, as well as all federal state or local laws, rules, regulations affecting the nurse's current area of practice. That's a huge burden for a nurse to know and conform to all those things. Is that possible? I don't think it is. So you have to know where to look 
for the things that you want to find, like the board's website is a good resource for all of the standards of nursing practice, all the board's rules, all the board's position statements. You should be aware of things and know what sort of categories of things you're looking for, in my opinion. Um, but that's a tall order for nurses, all nurses, to know and conform. <coughs> so, but the bottom line is it's a nurse's responsibility to know the Nurse Practice Act rules and regulations. So here's sort of our, the blueprint for our conversation today. We're going to talk about licensure and regulation, nursing ethics, nursing practice, nursing peer review, and disciplinary action. Does that sound okay? If any time you want to stop and ask a question, just raise your hand. I'll be happy to stop and talk about whatever you want to talk about. If what I say raises an issue in your head, and I see some people in the room that I can call on to phone a friend if I get <laughs> stumped. <laughs> So the main sources of the laws and regulations regarding nursing in Texas are the Nurse Practice Act, the Board of Nursing's Rules and Regulations, and the Board's position statements. The position statements that the Board has developed really don't have the force of law, but the Board encourages strongly nurses to choose their position statements um, that are applicable to their practice settings when they're into their daily practice and when they're considering a question. The board uses the position statements to cover things that haven't been covered by the Nurse Practice Act that the legislature creates or in their rules. For instance, the last position statement deals with social media. So that's something that's sort of come to the forefront since the Nurse Practice Act was put in place. The Nurse Practice Act is found in the Texas Occupations Code. So if you hear me refer to TOC further in the presentation, that's the Texas Occupations Code. More specifically in subtitle E, the regulation of nursing, and then chapters 301 through 305. 301 is the Nurse Practice Act, 303 is Nursing Peer Review, 304 is the Nurse Licensure Compact, and 305 is the APRN Licensure Compact. And it's really, the Nurse Practice Act is where the board gets its authority to act. Then you'll hear me refer to the TAC, or the Texas Administrative Code. That's where the board's rules and regulations reside. It's in Title 22 of the Texas Administrative Code, Part 11, Chapter 211. The Board of Nursing was established by the Nurse Practice Act. It empowers the board to, with the responsibility and legal authority for making sure that practitioners of nursing in Texas are competent and it grants authority to the board to make the rules and regulations to carry out the act. The board licenses qualified practitioners, does an, its enforcement functions, which is really investigating violations of the Nurse Practice Act and initiating appropriate legal action when necessary, and they establish minimum standards for educational programs in nursing. Here's the Board of Nursing's mission statement to protect and promote the welfare of the people of Texas by ensuring that each person holding a license as a nurse in the state of Texas is competent to practice safely. Does the board represent nurses? No, they represent the public. So the board fulfills their mission through the regulation of practice of nursing and the approval of nursing education programs. I think there are about 200 or so nursing programs in the state of Texas that are approved by the Board of Nursing and somewhere around 350,000 nurses that they license, LVNs, RNs, APRNs. This is, I told you that the Board of Nursing website was important. All the information that I'm gonna share with you today is available in different parts of the Board of Nursing website. That website is your friend, get familiar with it. Look for the topics that, that you have questions about on the website and I promise you that the answers are probably there may not be the answer that you want. How many of you have ever called up the Board of Nursing to ask them a question? Okay. They usually don't ask, answer questions with yes or no. They usually answer questions with it depends because that's the way it's laid out. You have to make decisions based on your practice setting, the context of practice that you're in. They can't give a yes or no answer for every practice setting or the context that everyone practices in. 
Licensure is required in Texas to practice as a nurse. A person can't practice or offer to profess practice professional nursing or vocational nursing unless the person's licensed. So I told you that I would be referring to initials. This initial MPA stands for the Nurse Practice Act, and that's the section of the Practice Act um, 301.251 for that is established. This section of the Nurse Practice Act really establishes that the Nurse Practice Act is a practice control act for nurses and for LVNs, RNs and LVNs. The use of titles. You have to have a license to use the title of nurse in the state of Texas. Registered nurse or RN or professional nurse or LVN, any designation that implies that a person is licensed or registered um, as, or a vocational nurse, you have to hold a license. Most of you probably know the reason that we have on our badges around here this RN insignia. The board requires that when a nurse is interacting with the public in a nursing role, that they have to wear an insignia that identifies themselves as an RN or an LVN. APRNs have to identify themselves with their APRN title. And then the nurse's first or last name has to be included along with the licensure level. Does everybody know that already? See, you already know and conform to the laws of the state of Texas as they apply to nursing. What? The latest is that has to be spelled out now. There is a new, um, it hasn't gone into effect yet. No. So, but there, and it's going to be able to be phased in over four years. That legislature just said that we're going to have to spell out, I think, registered nurse or advanced practice. So we're going to have to change these tags. I took mine off so I wouldn't play with it, but... <laughs> to registered nurse or advanced practice registered nurse or licensed vocational nurse. We haven't really explored what all that's going to mean for badging at UTMB, but that is coming up. Thanks, Valerie. How many of you remember getting the little wallet cards with your license in the mail every two years? The board decided back in September 2008 that they weren't going to do that anymore because of the uh, risk, really, I think, for fraud and people to present um, invalid licenses when they apply for employment. So patients, uh, paper license certificates still get issued uh, for graduate nurses who pass the NCLEX and attain their initial license. You get that little certificate suitable for framing. And then nurses who hold licenses in other states and are obtaining a Texas license for the first time. And then nurses who, for the first time, receive their full licensure as APRNs. Those all get the certificates. Employers can go onto the website to verify licensure status of all nurses that are seeking employment online. There's many avenues now for you to do that. You can do it on the NCSBN, which is the National Council of State Boards of Nursing website, or the Texas Board of Nurses website. Renewal of licensure. 60 days prior to license expiration, the Board of Nursing mails a postcard reminder to renew online. That's one of the really great reasons that you should keep your address updated with the Board of Nurse Examiners. <laughs> the board added the continuing competency chapter to the uh, rules and regulations. The purpose is to make sure that nurses stay abreast of their current industry practices, enhance their professional competence, learn about new technology and treatment regimens, and update their clinical skills. And these requirements for jurisprudence and geriatrics are part of the continuing competency requirements. All nurses are required to demonstrate continuing competency for renewal of their licensure. The continuing competence methods that are set out in the rules and regulations are that you can complete 20 hours of continuing education or you can attain, maintain, or renew an approved national nursing certification in the area of practice that you're in. So you remember I said that certification wouldn't take care of the requirements for geriatrics or um, nursing jurisprudence and ethics. These are the two things that were added by the board in their rulemaking when they added in 2014. So, like I said, the jurisprudence is every three years or six years, um, and the older adult is every renewal cycle. Yes, but it's interpreted very broadly, so I think it would apply to me. Even though I don't give direct care, I supervise the care of geriatric. Sorry, the question was: the geriatric requirement applies only to those people who are involved in that practice. 
So I think it's interpreted very broadly, and it would probably apply to someone like me who oversees that type of practice or to an educator who has responsibilities in geriatric education. Go next to the Nurse Licensure Compact. The Nurse Licensure Compact is an agreement between states to allow a person who's licensed in one state to practice in their home state and then also in that compact state. There's also an advanced practice registered nurse compact that allows the APRNs to hold one multi-state license uh, with the privilege to practice in other compact states. I think nursing's really lucky in this regard that our legislature recognized that this would be a good thing for nurses in Texas because they didn't allow physicians to do it in this past legislative session. There was a physician licensure compact um, bill that didn't pass. The nurse licensure compact, um, Texas was among the first of the states to adopt it. Um, the premise is that current licensure requirements are essentially the same from state to state, and it really doesn't interfere with each state defining its scope of practice, and it only defines requirements to hold a license. There, I think there are, well, the next slide probably, one of the next slides shows the map of the states that have the nurse licensure compact. Here are some of the definitions that are associated with the nurse licensure compact. There are party states, those states that have adopted the compact. The home state license is where the nurse uh, permanently resides. And then the remote state is the state where you practice using your multi-state privilege. And that has to be a party state for the nurse licensure compact to be in effect. The requirements for the nurse licensure compact are that you have to maintain your home state license, you have to adhere to the state practice laws of the state in which the patient that you're caring for is located when you're providing the care, you have to use the multi-state -privi multi privilege only in party states, and you have to hold a home license in one party state at a time. To practice in a state that isn't a part of the compact, you have to go get a license in that other state. So for instance, California is not a compact state, and if you wanted in, to practice in California, you would have to get a California license. You may uh, have a home state license and a license to practice in a non-party state at the same time, but you can't, you're not supposed to have a license in a compact state that you reside in and a, um, a, a resident license in an, another compact state. If you live in a non-party state and you come to Texas, uh, to practice, you have to get a um, non-resident Texas license. And here's the states in the dark blue that are current participants in the compact. So it's not all states. So the question was, does this have any bearing on the practice of telephonic nursing or telemedicine, telenursing um, with the uh, compact in these states? And the specific question was, for instance, if you're licensed in Texas, can you do telemedicine for Louisiana? I think the answer to that is no, because Louisiana is not a compact state, and so it's you know, where you're providing the care at the time, you have to be licensed there. So if you're licensed in Texas, you may be able to uh, do telemedicine in some places. It's just up to the interpretation. Does anybody know any uh, different information about that? I would be leery about practicing in a state that wasn't a member of the compact if I was doing telenursing somehow without a license in that state. So Tammy was saying that in the access center they encouraged the nurses not to triage patients who are not in Texas. In a non, in not, not in a compact state. They're in a compact state, yes. If they're in compact states, they allow that. David, the situation I have with the traveler, even though she had working in both compacts in Texas and everything was legit, she changed her home address back to Oklahoma, which 
was not a compact, so she had to change to the work in Texas. There's some, some very specific rules about if you move to Texas and practice under a compact license and you establish your permanent residence in Texas, you have a specific time frame to get your license in Texas. And I'm not covering um, that today, I don't think, but I think it's about 90 days. that you If you change your permanent residence, you need to change your resident licensure to the correct state. I don't think that's in here. But it's a, a very important point in that. We have dealt with that with a couple of nurses uh, who came here before. Thanks, Steve. Any questions about licensure and regulation or anything that you think I left out that you want to dig into deeper? If not, we'll move on to nursing ethics. So year after year, the nursing profession is recognized as one of the most trusted professions. It's important to maintain that trust so that we can practice efficiently. efficiently. So when we're thinking about ethics in this context, it's really what's good and bad and what's the moral duty and obligation, as I told you that definition up front. When you're thinking about good professional character in Texas, this is how the board has defined it in their rules and regulations. And I think those, what is that, five words that I underlined at the bottom? When you think about ethics in nursing in Texas, you should think about those five words. Honesty, accountability, trustworthiness, reliability, and integrity. So it's, this board statement says that good professional character is an integrated pattern of personal, academic, and occupational behaviors, which in the judgment of the board indicates that an individual is able to consistently conform his or her conduct to the requirements of the Nurse Practice Act, the board's rules and regulations, and generally accepted standards of nursing practice, including but not limited to behaviors in the five that I listed. It's sort of like the Boy Scout oath, the Boy Scouts, trustworthy, loyal, friendly, kind, obedient, cheerful, thrifty, those, those things. But what's being honest in the context of nursing ethics? Can you think of an example? Well, accountability is the next, um, the next word. But being honest and admitting that, admitting that you made a mistake, that could be an honesty thing. I was thinking um, that charting accurate um, things that you observed or charting accurately is, can, could be considered honesty. Any other example? Truthful in providing information. Truthful in providing information. Anything else? If you don't know how to do something, admitting it. So there's lots of aspects of honesty uh, that we deal with on a daily basis. Um, accountability, as um, Dieter mentioned, could be owning up to a mistake. I think accountable to make sure that you know that the drugs you're administering, you know the side effects, the reason that you're administering them. What other aspects of accountability are there in good professional character? Think of any? Pat. Owning and acknowledging when you have an error. Owning and acknowledging when you have an error. That's that's good. Trustworthiness. Can you think of any examples of trustworthiness as it applies to nursing practice? Keeping the information given to you private and confidential. Sometimes we have patients that come to the emergency room with uh, thousands of dollars of cash in their pocket. So making sure that those are dealt with according to the institution's policy and, and se secured safely, I think that's an aspect of trustworthiness. Anything else? Reliability, can you think of any examples of reliability as it relates to ethics and good professional character in nursing? Well, you know, you know you're going to follow through on the assignment. Pam said that showing up on time for your assigned shifts. Those are aspects of reliability, I think. Integrity. Think of examples of integrity as it applies to nursing practice and ethical conduct. Do what you say you're going to do. Do what you say you're going to do. Can you, can you be more elaborate about a nursing situation? I'm going to call the physician and get a change in your pain medication. Do it. So I'm going to, if you tell a patient I'm going to call the physician and get a change in your pain medication, 
you might be um, wise to go ahead and follow through with that. So doing what you say you're going to do. So what are some of the factors that the board uses to uh, determine good professional character? Remember it said in the board's opinion. Good professional character in the board's opinion. So when they look at it, they look at, does the nurse know how to distinguish right from wrong? Do they think and act rationally? Do they keep promises and honor obligations? Are they accountable for their own behavior? Are they able to practice nursing in an autonomous role with patients and clients and their families and significant others and members of the public who are or may become physically, emotionally, or financially vulnerable? Factors uh, continued. Can the nurse recognize and honor the interprofessional boundaries appropriate to any therapeutic relationship or healthcare setting? And can they promptly, promptly and fully self-disclose facts, circumstances, events, errors, or omissions when such disclosure could enhance the health status of the patients, clients, or the public, or could protect patients, clients from the public or the public from unnecessary risk of harm? More. Has the nurse been convicted of a felony or of a misdemeanor involving moral turpitude? Anybody know what moral turpitude is? What is the board's idea of moral turpitude? <laughs> I think it's a, a combination. There's no good definition out there of moral turpitude, but I think it's a combination of the things that we've been talking about of good professional character. So it's just a, an amalgamation of all those things. Um, so... A crime involving a misdemeanor involving moral turpitude or an order of probation with or without an adjudication of guilt for an offense that would be a felony or a misdemeanor involving moral turpitude if guilt were adjudicated. What does that mean? <laughs> Goodness gracious. So you, you, you have to know and conform to the laws that affect, affect nursing practice. So how do you break that down? So basically, if you are convicted for a felony, or a misdemeanor involving moral turpitude, or you're on probation for one of those, or if you've been, uh, let's see, adjudication of guilt for, if, um, so you can have like um, deferred adjudication where you don't get uh, ultimately convicted, and then you would need to report that to the board because guilt could have been adjudicated. And then uh, another factor is any revocation, suspension, or denial of any um, other adverse or any other adverse action relating to the person's license or privilege to practice nursing in another jurisdiction. So the criminal behavior disclosure requirements. Uh, requirements for criminal history applications for a license. An applicant for a license has to disclose their criminal history. And then for renewal of of a license, you have to disclose your criminal history. What do you have to disclose? Those things that we just talked about, convictions, deferred adjudications, that's the one that I mentioned that where you might have been convicted guilty, but you got deferred adjudication through the court, you need to report that. Probated sentences, and then domestic offenses. Any questions about those good professional character things? See, Diane has some. Um, move on to professional boundaries next. So what are professional boundaries? Those are the appropriate limits which would, should be established by the nurse in the nurse-client relationship due to the nurse's power and the patient's vulnerability. It refers to the provision of nursing services within the limits of the nurse-client relationship which promote the client's dignity, independence, and best interests and refrain from inappropriate involvement in the client's personal relationships and or the attainment of nurses' personal gain at the client's expense. So this is uh, one way that the National Council of State Boards of Nursing has chosen to sort of illustrate professional boundaries. And you'll see on the right side that um, <coughs> there would be too much care provider involvement. On the left side, there would be too little care provider involvement. And right in the middle, you have that what they call the zone of helpfulness or patient-centered care. Does that make sense? So if you stray too far to the right, you'd be over-involved. You stray too far to the left, you would be under-involved. Rule 217.11 of the Standards of Nursing Practice 
say that a nurse should know, recognize, and maintain professional boundaries of the nurse-client relationship. And position statement 15.29 that I mentioned earlier deals with the use of social media and really cautions uh, the nurse to consider whether they should friend or like or that sort of uh, social media thing with a patient or a former patient. Misconduct in this area could include violating professional boundaries of the nurse-client relationship, including but not limited to the following, physical, sexual, emotional, or financial exploitation of the client or the client's significant other. One case we had at UTMB involved a nurse whose husband was a real estate agent, and she heard her patient say that they were trying to sell some property. And she said, oh, my husband's a real estate agent. Maybe he could help you. The deal went sour. Um, the patient got harmed in the financial transaction. And the nurse got held responsible by the Board of Nursing for violating professional boundaries. It's a really sad case when I know the nurse was just trying to help. But is that therapeutic for the patient to get involved in saying, I know somebody who could help you with your real estate transaction? Probably not. So it probably was more towards the over-involvement side. So the unprofessional conduct rules in the nurse um, in the board's rules and regulations is at 217.12. So here, there are several of them. <laughs> Using fraud or deceit in procuring a license, improperly using a nursing license, impersonating another person in an examination, aiding and abetting someone in unlawful practice, failing to cooperate with a lawful investigation, behaving in a threatening or violent manner in the workplace is considered unprofessional conduct. Well, you've seen the incivility um, presentations is that behaving in a threatening or violent manner in the workplace? And should we be reporting nurses to the board for unprofessional conduct when they're incivil? I, I don't know. We haven't gone there. I don't know if anybody who has, but certainly that there are some behaviors that could be considered threatening. What do you think? Depends on the situation. Depends on the situation. <laughs> it depends. That's always the answer, right? <laughs> it depends. Another um, area of unprofessional conduct is offering, giving, soliciting, or receiving, or agreeing to receive directly or indirectly any fee or consideration to or from a third party for the referral of a client in connection with the performance of professional services. Any question about nursing ethics as the board contemplates it in relation to their rules? I do have one question, David, and that is, um, how, if, if someone is reported to, oh, sorry, if someone is reported to the board, the nurse is reported to the board, um, I wonder how the board measures character. Would, I mean, are there examples of how, or how do they interview people that you work with? Do you know? So those five words that we talked about, honesty, mm -hmm. integrity, um, they, they look at the whole context of the situation, and they deter try to determine the nurse's behavior related to those, related to those five things. And yes, they conduct a thorough investigation. They talk to people, they request records, they uh, request employment records, they request payroll and time records. In every instance where we report a nurse to the board for any conduct, they send requests for records, and we have to send them back with affidavits saying that they're true and correct copies of the records that we maintain in the normal course of our business. And they usually ask for all those things, any medication administration records, any um, time and attendance records, any personnel records showing when they applied for their job, those kinds of things, just looking for anything. And then I think they also... Reach, their investigators reach out and do interviews, but they really look to the whole way that that nurse practiced to see if they were honest, if they were accountable, if they were trustworthy, if they were reliable, and they, they acted with integrity, and that's how they determine good professional character. But it is, 
in their judgment. So, you know, you and I might have a different um, understanding of what being honest with somebody is, but it's really up to the board. And I think it, you know, those things we talked about are pretty common, common sense that you're going to document things honestly that you observed or that you, um, your patient reported that you're going to report those honestly. So I think they look to those sorts of things. Anybody have any experience uh, with those kinds of things with the board that they want to share? Any, anybody from peer review have any? I think it just boils down to where are they doing the best thing that they could have done for the patient's benefit and not for their own benefit. <clears throat> so it, she, Kim said it boils down to whether they're doing the best thing for the patient and not for their own benefit. So that could be another thing that they look at, and you probably could categorize that under one of these five words. So, I mean, in summary, there are some objective things that can, uh, you know, prove or, or disprove something, you know, that the person is being honest, accountable, and so on. Well, if they were dishonest, they, they would find that they didn't have meet that standard of good professional character. If they didn't act with accountability, they weren't trustworthy. If they stole the money that they were supposed to put in security when the patient came into the emergency department, that would be considered uh, not good professional character. And then these factors that we talked about, distinguishing right from wrong, do they think and act rationally? Do they keep their promises and honor obligations, are they accountable for their own behavior? Those are things that they would look to. Any other thoughts? Pat? Just one that the, um, the board can ask for written testimony from anybody who's involved peripherally to a case as well as the nurse who's been reported. So Pat, um, <laughs> saying that the board can ask for written testimony from anyone who's involved with this, with this situation under which they're investigating a nurse and use that information in their determination of good professional character. Thanks, Pat. Any other comments? So Jennifer said that in her experience they use the standard of what would a reasonable and prudent nurse have done in, a, in the same or a similar situation. I'm seeing more. Uh, I know. I know the hospital has the policy on the personal electronic device. And what I, more articles I'm seeing is uh, the nurses at the bedside uh, are coming uh, from a risk management point of view. You're looking at it. The nurses are on their cell phones and not caring for the patients. So I'm seeing more articles. You know, they always talk about HIPAA and HIPAA violations. While they may not be doing that, there's still there's a level of accountability and it, risk management goes up in safety when the nurse is not being attentive to the patient. So. Thanks, Steve. Um, I think we have a, a job to do with our patients to educate them that we use devices that look like cell phones to communicate with each other in the hospital in many places and that it's not a cell phone that the nurse is paying attention to instead of taking care of you. It could be the nurse conversing with another care provider about you on that device. We have some education to do there with our patients. We do allow nurses to use personal devices in the workplace because they can access drug information, they can access up-to-date evidence-based information. So we do allow that. And the, you know, one of the things that the nurses said, well, you allow the residents to do it, so why can't we? So we really didn't have an argument that said we, why we wouldn't allow nurses to do that. So we have opened up using personal devices in the patient care areas to access information that might assist you in caring for your patient. There are things that you shouldn't do with your cell phones when you're in the patient care environment that could get you in trouble. You shouldn't text personally protected patient information. You shouldn't take photographs that are going to reside on your cell phone. There are things that you shouldn't do with your personal devices, but there are things that are allowed, like looking up evidence-based information or drug information. Any other, anybody else have thoughts about personal devices in <coughs> the workplace? Even talking about nurses texting patients at home. 
and, and asking them how things are going and do they have any questions. And then that is um, uh, encouraging the patient to answer the phone for patient satisfaction um, surveys because they say, well, and we'll be calling you in a couple of days to find out how you're doing or whatever. And so the reason, I mean, I just think they're here to stay and we've just got to figure out how to use them. So Valerie said that in some of the emergency journals, nursing journals, they're talking about texting patients and reminding them to answer the phone when they get a phone call and um, following up with the patients that way. There are secure messaging platforms out there where you can send secure text messages, but most of us don't have secure text messaging on our personal devices. So if they're texting from a personal device to a patient, I think that probably would be a boundary violation so that well, you I could... Mean, they, they have, uh, you know, hospitals are using a particular device. Yeah. I think we were talking about personal personal devices, um, Steve's example, but that's a good point that there are secure messaging platforms and we're examining those at UTMB. We already have the, what are the phones, Tim? Volt. We're at, look, Volt has a, a secure messaging platform that we're looking at. We've also, what? Ask Hillary. Ask, ask Hillary. She has her own server and secure platform. <laughs> But there are no political endorsements in this room today, right? <laughs> what about my chart? My chart. You can write most, my chart is a secure messaging device because you have to have a password. You have to sign in, and it's only available to you, and you've gone through the process to request that access. Jennifer? Uh, to address the cell phones um, thing, we had a meeting with a client about a year ago related to uh, one of my district projects, and it was try to increase readmissions. And one way to do that was to keep um, open communication with patients. So um, we have um, explored texting and, and do use that. When we spoke with the client, we, they recommended that before we begin any of that, that you sort of send a text to the patient when they respond to you, that you don't initiate that conversation first. That once they respond to you, you clarify with them that you understand that this is not secure and, and that type of thing and they consent to that, um, she thought that that was fine. So Jennifer said they worked with compliance to work out a way to reduce readmissions where they got the patient's permission to send them um, texts in an unsecure way and when the patient agreed to that they assumed that consent to be valid to communicate with them that way. I still would um, caution against sending like patient information to a physician um, saying, you know, the patient in room 10 has a low blood pressure. That, that, or, uh, remember you got an appointment, that, right. hey, did you take your meds today? Or, you know, um, how are you feeling? You sending know, sending protected health information is probably not in compliance with HIPAA unless you're using a secure platform. Thanks. Any other comments? Thanks for bringing that up, Steve. Nursing practice, the standards of nursing practice. These appear in Rule 217.12. Um, these rules cover the standards of nursing practice that apply to all nurses, including RNs, LVNs, and advanced practice registered nurses. This is a rule you should know well, um, or at least be fully aware of. What does it say? I already told you the first one, that all nurses in Texas are expected to know and conform to the Texas Nurses Practice Act and the board rules and regulations. That they're expected to promote a safe environment for clients and others. That they know the rationale for and the effects of medications and treatments and correctly administer them. That they accurately and completely report and document. That they respect the client's right to privacy by protecting confidential information. That they promote and participate in education and counseling that they notify the appropriate supervisor when leaving a nursing assignment, that they know, recognize, and maintain professional boundaries of the nurse-client relationship. You can see how many of these principles of good professional character are woven into the standards of nursing practice. So the scope of practice, the role of the LVN, the role of the RN, just this little chart sort of talks about what the LVN can do, what the RN can do. On the, left the LVN, they have a directed scope of practice that has to be supervised. It has to be supervised by an RN, a physician, 
a dentist, a podiatrist. The RN, on the other hand, works in both structured and unstructured healthcare environments, and their practice does not have to be supervised. The LVN is educated to care for clients with stable and predictable conditions. The RN is responsible for the well-being of patients overall. The LVN is educated to do hands-on assessments using their senses. And the RN functions within the scope of the Nurse Practice Act and the board's rules. Professional nursing only on the left. Um, again, practice independently within the Nurse Practice Act and board rules. Vocational nursing on the right, participate in the planning of nursing care. Professional nursing only, make nursing diagnoses. Vocational nursing, assist in evaluating patient response to nursing care. Professional nursing on uh, the left again, develop a nursing care plan. Then the vocational nurse can perform a focused assessment. And then the RN can perform comprehensive assessment and evaluate the patient response to nursing care. And those are functions that the LVN is not, or is not within the LVN scope of practice. LVN supervision, the, and I already told you this, the practice of vocational nursing must be performed under the supervision of a registered nurse, a physician, a physician assistant, a podiatrist, or a dentist. And advanced practice registered nurses are covered under the registered nurse there. What, did it, what is the duty of a nurse in any practice setting? There's a position statement on this, uh, position statement 15.14. It establishes that through the MPA, or the Nurse Practice Act, and the board's rules, that a nurse has a responsibility and a duty to a client or patient to provide and coordinate the delivery of safe, effective nursing care, and that this duty supersedes any facility policy or physician order. This uh, language came from a landmark case in Texas, which was Lunsford versus the Board of Nurse Examiners. This was a, a case that um, was in the courts in 1983, so it probably happened a few years before that in real time. Do you, does anybody know the fact scenario around the Lunsford case? It, it said, frightening fact scenario, a patient with crushing substernal chest pain, nausea and vomiting presented to a small hospital in South Texas. <coughs> and there was a physician on duty, a nurse on duty. I think the nurse told the physician that somebody was there with chest pain, and he said, oh, send him to another hospital. So the nurse, with that information, went and told the patient and the person that the patient was with that they needed to drive to the nearest hospital that could take care of a cardiac condition, and that they should honk their horn and put their flashers on while they're driving. About five minutes away from the hospital after they left, the guy died. So the board was trying to take the nurse's license away, and the nurse appealed that decision and said that she should, she was just relying on what the physician told her. And the board, or the, the court held, and um, it never went up to the Supreme Court after the appeals court. I think it was a no writ case, which means it, it didn't go to the appeal, uh, Supreme Court. But the court said that the board was right, that the nurse has a duty to the patient that supersedes um, the hospital policy of the physician order, and that she should have taken action to stabilize that patient and make sure that he was taken care of and that the <laughs> physician knew his exact, exact condition. So this is really a landmark case and it land, led to that language that was in that previous slide. So the scope of practice for nurses in Texas. The Nurse Practice Act and the board's rules and regulations define the legal scope of practice for nurses. The LVN scope of practice is further articulated in that position statement 15.27. And then the RN's duty is to always provide safe, compassionate, and comprehensive nursing care to patients. And that's further articulated in a, um, the position statement 15.28, which is three or four pages long. It's worth a look if you get a chance to look at those position statements on the role or the scope of LVN and RN practice. Graduate nurses. Supervision is required for a period of six months or a lesser time if the new graduate and their supervising nurse agree. Their competence to perform independently should be mutually determined by the new graduate and the supervising nurse and demonstrated and supported by documentation. Do we comply with those um, <coughs> requirements at UTMB? We leave new graduates in the nurse clinician one role for six months and we do a good job of documenting and um, demonstrating 
that they're competent to carry out their roles, I think. <laughs> Nurses that transition back to a practice area or a new practice area, there's some requirements that the board has set out in the scope of practice for them that they shouldn't act as a charge nurse for at least six months unless there's a lesser time period that's agreed on by the nurse and his or her supervisor, and it should be based on the competency of the nurse. So I think we probably all know nurses who are transitioning to a new practice area who could probably, based on their experience, take charge in any situation, right? So they might be competent to be a charge nurse. It just depends on the context. Like I said at the beginning, there's no yes or no answers in most situations. It's just, it depends. The board has developed a six step decision making model for nurses to determine whether something is within their scope of practice. It's really that it depends scenario set into a six step decision model. It was, the tool was developed by the board to assist nurses in making good professional judgments about the nursing tasks or procedures that they choose to undertake. And I hear if you call the board and ask them if you can do something, that they, the first thing they do is to ask you to look at the six-step decision-making model or ask you whether you have looked at the six-step decision-making model. The goal is to make sure that nurses only accept the assignments for which the nurse has education, training, and skill competency. And these are the six steps. The first step is the nurse is to ask if the activity is consistent with the Nurse Practice Act, the board rules, the board position statements, and or guidelines. If it's yes, they should continue through the next five steps. If it's no, it's not within their scope of practice and they should stop. The second step is, is the activity appropriately authorized by a valid order, protocol, and in accordance with established policies and procedures. If it is, you can continue to the next step. If it's not, you should stop the decision-making model. The third is, is the act supported by either research reported in nursing and health-related literature or in a scope of practice statement by a national nursing organization? If it is, you can go on through the other uh, steps in the decision-making model. If it's not, you should stop, and it's not within the scope of practice. The fourth is, do you possess the required knowledge and have you demonstrated the competency required to carry out this activity safely. If it is, you can go on to the next uh, two steps. If it's not, you should stop and it's not within the scope of practice. The fifth, would a reasonable and prudent nurse perform this activity in this setting? That's uh, what Jennifer alluded to earlier in her experience with the board. If the answer is yes, you should continue to the last step. And if it's not, you should stop. It's not within the scope of practice. And the last one is, you, are you a pre prepared to assume accountability for the provision of safe care and the outcome of the care rendered? If you answered yes to all six of those questions, it's something that's within your scope of practice and you can perform the activity. If it's not, you shouldn't, and it's not within the scope of practice. So now you see why the board answers the question with, it depends. It depends. <laughs> Delegation is the next thing I want. Any, any questions about the six-step decision-making model or scope of practice? Okay. Delegation is the next thing I wanted to talk about. Delegation is when you authorize an unlicensed person to provide nursing service while retaining accountability for how the unlicensed person performs the task. It does not include situation in which an unlicensed person is directly assisting an RN when they're carrying out nursing tasks in the presence of an RN. Remember that RNs can delegate, LVNs can supervise, but they can't delegate. The RN is responsible for the evaluation of the delegated task to ensure that it was completed and completed correctly. According to the uh, Board of Nursing website, uh, many Nurses find delegation to be a perplexing concept with multiple nuances, another it depends situation. The board uh, created a delegation resource packet for nurses to get clearer direction for delegation in a variety of settings um, so that they can improve the delegation process. And it's available at that um, website link. I guess we can send the slides out with the survey or give them a way to access them, like a, through a link or something. It will be provided, Mary Bell says. Yeah, we can put them on the web. And she operates with integrity, so we know she's going to be 
That's, re- that's repetitive. I must have been really important. I put it in there twice. <laughs> so nursing tasks that are prohibited from delegation. The formulation of the nursing care plan and the evaluation of the client's response to the care rendered is the sole responsibility of the RN that can't be delegated. <coughs> then specific tasks involved in the implementation of the care plan which require professional nursing judgment or intervention are things that cannot be delegated. Also, the responsibility and accountability for client health teaching and health counseling, which promotes client education and involves the client's significant others in accomplishing health goals, is the sole discretion of the RN. And the administration of medications, including intravenous (laughs) fluids, except by medication aids as permitted under um, that rule that allows medication aids to administer medications. So that LVNs can also administer medications, so that means that they can't, deli- they can't supervise the administration of medications by another person. Any questions about delegation or scope of practice? No? Peer review. I promised to tell you about two types of peer review when I did the objectives. So the, um, first I wanted to cover the mandatory reporting requirement. In Texas, a nurse shall report to the board if the nurse has reasonable cause to suspect that another nurse has engaged in conduct subject to reporting or the ability of a nursing student to perform the services of the nursing profession would be or would reasonably be expected to be impaired by chemical dependency. So did you know that you had that duty to report a nursing student who you thought might not be able to practice nursing because of um, impairment? There's an alternative to mandatory reporting. So instead of reporting to the board, a nurse may make a report to a nursing peer review committee or to the nursing educational program in which the student's enrolled. The employer has a duty to report in certain situations. If as an employer we terminate um, a nurse, either voluntarily or involuntarily, or we suspend them for seven or more days, or we take other substantive disciplinary action against a nurse, or substantially equivalent action against an agency nurse for nursing practice errors or concerns, we have to report the board uh, to the board in writing. And that's something that we... Um, take very seriously and make sure that we do in those types of situations. Next I'll discuss minor incidents. The Nurse Practice Act defines a minor incident as that conduct that does not indicate that the continuing practice of nursing by an affected nurse poses a risk of harm to the client or other person. There are some exclusions to the minor incident rule. One, Any error that contributed to a patient's death can't be a minor incident. Any criminal conduct that's defined in the Nurse Practice Act can't be a minor incident. And then any serious violation of the board's unprofessional conduct rule involving intentional or unethical conduct such as fraud, theft, patient abuse, or patient exploitation cannot be considered a minor incident. Any questions about mandatory reporting or minor incidents. So the Texas Occupations Code Chapter 303 is the nursing peer review part of the Nurse Practice Act. And this chapter defines nursing peer review as the evaluation of nursing services, the qualifications of a nurse, the quality of patient care rendered by a nurse, the merits of a complaint concerning a nurse or nursing care, and a determination or recommendation regarding a complaint. And there's two types, as I told you, of peer review. The first type is incident-based peer review. It's incident-based because it relates to an incident that is reported after the fact. So it starts with an error or an incident. (coughs) To date, these are the most frequent types of peer review cases that we see incident-based peer review. It can be initiated by a nurse, a facility, an association, a school, an agency, 
or any other setting that utilizes the services of a nurse. It can be a uh, safe harbor peer review as the other type of peer review. We see many fewer of these, although we, though we do see a few safe harbor peer reviews. Um, it may be initiated by an LVN, an RN, or advanced practice registered nurse prior to accepting assignment. That's really important. Prior to accepting assignment or engaging in requested conduct that the nurse believes would place patients at risk of harm, thus potentially causing the nurse to violate his or her duty to the patients. Invoking safe harbor in accordance with the rule protects the nurse from licensure action by the board as well as from retaliatory action by the employer. So a nurse, before engaging in an assignment, can invoke safe harbor and get protection from any licensure action by the board or any retaliatory action by the employer. So who has to have um, these things in place? Employers of 10 or more licensed nurses must have a peer review committee, and the committee has to give the nurse being reviewed at least minimum due process. And the due process requirements are that they have to be given written notice of the charges against them, um, and it has to be done within a specific time frame. They have to have a specific time to respond to that complaint, and they have to know where to send their response. Anything else in that, Pat, or? I think that's pretty, pretty generally it. And the committee has time frames. Oh, I have, them, I have them set out here, so you don't have to tax my brain anymore. So if you're doing incident-based peer review, you have to have written policies and procedures. At UTMB, we have written policies and procedures about peer review that are available on the website. The nurse must receive notice um, and have the opportunity to respond to the notice. And the nurse may have an attorney and will get feedback um, after the decision and they have a chance to respond to the decision that the peer review committee makes. The, again, the minimum due process rights include the notice in writing or in person. Um, the notice has to describe the events um, in sufficient detail to make sure that the nurse understands the incident, the circumstances, and conduct, either their error or their omission that's being um, investigated. And the nurse will have the opportunity to submit a written statement regarding the event under review. And they have the opportunity to call witnesses, question with witnesses, and be present when testimony or evidence is being presented. Um, one thing I always like to make clear about uh, peer review and disciplinary action is they're two separate things. Employment and licensure are separate um, actions. An employer can take disciplinary action before review by the peer review committee is conducted um, because the peer review committee really doesn't determine issues related to employment whether the nurse should be disciplined or not. The role of peer review committee is to determine if license vi violations have occurred, and if so, if the violations require reporting to the board. Any comments about incident-based peer review from anybody who's been involved? It's a scary proposition for the nurse in most cases, we find out. Zena? Um, the Board of Nursing is there to protect the public. The um, university is there to protect the best interests of the university. But nurses don't really have anyone but themselves. So if you're replaced in that situation, you need to realize that and make sure that you're represented properly. So that would be the only So Zena's comment was that the Board of Nursing, as we talked about earlier, is there to protect the public. That. The university is here to protect the interests of the university and its assets and its patients and that the nurse who's subject to peer review is really on their own and if they feel like they need um, representation that they should take advantage of that um, opportunity. Is that essentially what you said? <coughs> Any other comments about Charlotte? Um, I think along with what Sandra just said, then the next step is every nurse should have their own malpractice insurance because, um, again, the hospital is protecting their own interests. So Charlotte's advocating that every nurse should have their own uh, malpractice insurance because the hospital is uh, protecting their interests. Thanks for that comment, Charlotte. Any other comments about peer review, incident-based peer review? Tammy?
do they know if someone calls and you put someone to the board, um, are you then required to are you notified somehow that you need to know this organization? Are you notified and then you are obligated to do that peer review or or and what happens if you fail to do that? So Tammy noticed the part that said that, that any employer who has 10 or more nurses, licensed nurses has to have a peer review committee. Um, and she, her question was, if someone calls and reports a nurse to the board, does the board then turn around and see if that per, um, where that nurse is employed has 10 or more employees, where they have a peer review committee, and whether the conduct was reported to that peer review committee? Um, it depends. <laughs> <laughs> It depends. Um, they typically notify us when they've taken action against a nurse that's employed by us when the nurse has listed us as their employer. There's no, no um, requirement that you list the correct employer other than good professional character and being honest on the forms that you submit to the board. So they, unless the practice was in our facility that they're investigating. They might not know that the nurse had been employed here. If the practice was involved here, sometimes the first notice that we get that someone has reported someone to the board is that request for records. So we, I, the other day, got out of the blue a request for records on a nurse from the board of nurse examiners to look at their employment records, their employment history, their time in attendance, um, and a couple other things. So we send those subpoenas to legal, and legal deals with getting them um, uh, responded to in the right way and make sure the affidavits are filled out. So that sometimes can be the only um, notice that we get. But if you were to report somebody, you would have to do the peer review process if, first? If we report somebody, if, they've, if we've terminated them, or suspended them, or taken substantive disciplinary action against them, we typically do that right after the... Um, disciplinary action, but we in turn still need to do a peer review. Sometimes it's not as timely as we want it to be, but we're really supposed to do the peer review of that nurse's actions. And that termination is for a practice incident. If we terminate somebody for time in attendance or they show up to work consistently late or uh, don't come to work at all, it's not really a practice violation. Amanda? Uh, you don't have a lot of time, but I, I was. I wanted to. We got plenty of time. <laughs> 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 I just wanted to ask a little bit about the peer review process. Um, when, let's say that a um, uh, an event where a, a patient died, a permanent injury, let's say, or a patient died, and the nurse uh, has a decision to go to peer review, do they. Does the peer review process just look at the practice of the nurse against the, um, uh, the law and the, the license, or do they look at everybody in the story and the whole multidisciplinary and the whole systemic process? Do they just look at the law? It, it depends. <laughs> <laughs> <You're> <laughs> <laughs> Pat's, Pat's going to help me out. Let me give it a stab, and then I'll ask okay. Pat to back me up. <laughs> does the framework around the nursing law. If there are things that come up at events and they involve other disciplines, the peer review committee shares those findings with the other disciplines or is aware that it's been looked into so they don't get into the medical practice or the radiology practice or that they stay with nursing and they stay with the law. We look at safety we look at advocacy for the nurse, we look at the nursing practice standards, and we'll look wider than the event. We look at the implications for the system as well. Okay. So they also look at the context of the situation, the staffing, um, the workload, the system issues that might have impacted the situation. A nurse can refuse to go to peer review. They can say, I'm not coming. We'll still hold peer review. They want to be there to talk about their event. Just like okay. Zena cautioned that it's in their best interest to take advantage of the protections that they have afforded them under the due process 
uh, concepts, they need to take advantage of those and not ignore the request or say, I'm not going to participate, so you can't do anything to me. That's not the stance to take. The nurse can come with their attorney. Their attorney cannot speak, and if they invite an attorney, the hospital will also have an attorney. And there are rules that unless our attorney speaks, their attorney cannot speak. So they pretty much sit there and list them. But they can't advise their client during the process, and the client, yes. the, the nurse can ask questions, as you saw, is, is the board's rules and the, um, the Nurse Practice Act allow the nurse to ask questions of any witnesses. And sometimes, if they have an attorney, their attorney will advise them. Why don't you ask? Yes. Excellent. David, I have a question. If a nurse works in a facility and in the patient care is has come forward to her administrative superiors with her safety concerns, and those concerns weren't addressed, and those superiors have since left the facility, do I have an obligation and a duty to report those superiors to the board for their participation in not addressing the issues? I would say yes if they were licensed as a nurse, that their, their actions should be reported to the board. Absolutely. Thank you. It's an intimidating process. We take, try to make it at UTMB as non-intimidating as we possibly can and um, really examine the nursing practice with <coughs> peers, peers of that nurse. So Janet, you, Janet's been a long time participant in the peer review process and has a comment. I think everyone needs to realize that the people that are on the peer review one of the things that we really focus on are system errors. That we're not holding this just to look simply at the nurse who's involved in the situation, but looking at the entire picture. And in the past, sometimes our peer review uh, comments that we send to the board of the nurses ends up being very positive for the nurse. And it's a group of peers who have found all these different system errors led to this practice here, and with that information, the board has more information I, I would say more times than not, the nurses who serve on our peer review committees are advocates for the nurse and really try to ferret out those system issues that may have led to um, a situation. But they really still, like Pat said, follow the framework of the Nurse Practice Act and the board's rules and regulations to assess a nurse's practice, but they do a very good job of bringing in those <coughs> contextual sorts of things that were involved in the system to make sure that those are highlighted for the board in case they make any decision based on what the peer review committee found. Is that fair? Right on. <laughs> the um, second, any, any other questions about incident-based peer review? No? Safe Harbor peer review is the second type of peer review. And this, um, which I told you earlier, has to be in, uh, invoked before the nurse engages in the conduct or the assignment for which they're requesting peer review. It can be invoked at any time during the work period when the initial assignment changes. So if I accept an assignment, I can't go back and claim Safe Harbor for an assignment that I've already accepted. But if my assignment changes during a shift, if I get a different type of patient into the situation, I can claim uh, safe harbor peer review when that assignment changes. Examples of safe harbor situations might include uh, clinical assignments where the staffing's not adequate or where the acuity of the patients is beyond that that the nurse believes patient harm might result. This, um, again, must have been really important, so I repeated it uh, twice on slide 86. So activation of Safe Harbor Peer Review. The nurse who wants to activate Safe Harbor Peer Review has to take some specific actions. They have to notify the supervisor when making the assignment in writing that the nurse is invoking Safe Harbor. They can't call the clinical operations administrator and say, I'm invoking Safe Harbor. That won't cut it. They have to do it in writing. They have to do it before they engage in the conduct or assignment for which safe harbor is requested. And then, 
before they leave work at the end of their shift, they have to complete the comprehensive request for safe harbor nursing peer review. So two documents, two things in writing. One, the initial request for safe harbor. It doesn't have to be formal. It can just be I'm requesting safe harbor for blank. And then before they leave that uh, day, they have to do the comprehensive request for safe harbor nursing peer review. And that document's available, I think, on our website. It's available on the Board of Nurse Examiners website. You shouldn't mail or fax your request for safe harbor nursing peer review to the Board of Nursing. Um, the board doesn't conduct peer review. That's not what they're there for. That has to be done through the facility or the agency where the assignment was made to you. So what are the protections for the nurse under safe, peer, safe harbor peer review? The nurse that in good faith, and that's important, good faith, you have to have a good faith belief that what you're being asked to do would violate the Nurse Practice Act. You have, when you request safe harbor in good faith, you can't be disciplined, you can't be discriminated against for making the request, you can't be retaliated against. You can go ahead and do the assignment that you've been asked to do pending the peer review. So if you come into a situation, like I said, staffing or patient acuity could be situations. If you come into a situation where the staffing's not um, where you think it needs to be, you can invoke safe harbor and you can go ahead and take that assignment and you won't be disciplined by the board for engaging that in that assignment if um, a problem happens. You can withdraw the request for safe harbor. The re nurse's request for safe harbor peer review does not become invalid, and the um, nurse doesn't just have to withdraw it because the supervisor is uh, able to respond with adequate staff. So you come in, and there's an unsafe staffing situation. You invoke safe harbor by putting in writing that you want to invoke it, and the clinical operations administrator is able to find another person to come and help you. You can still proceed with that safe harbor. You don't have to uh, drop it just because the supervisor has been able to take care of your request um, or whatever the original issue was with the requested assignment. It's the nurse's choice whether they want to still have the peer review of the situation or not. It's important things for people to remember. And I think maybe that um, our nurses don't use safe harbor peer review um, enough. Um, although we cringe when we get a safe harbor, I think um, we shouldn't. We should want our nurses to be protected in their practice and, um, you know, safe harbor's a protection for the nurse that the board allows. Although the board doesn't protect nurses, it protects the public. It allows nurses to protect themselves through this mechanism. David, but if the nurse um, <coughs> requests safe harbor, or initiates the process appropriately, there it will there will be a peer review. Um, review. Yes. There will be a review of the case. You know what I'm saying. There, yeah. So if the nurse correctly invokes <laughs> safe harbor peer review in writing, I think Carla's asking, will there subsequently be a peer review? Yes, unless it's withdrawn, and they don't have to withdraw it unless they want to, even if the situation is taken care of. So you can continue with safe harbor request and the safe harbor peer review will be done um, even if the situation was taken care of. Pat, any um, follow-up to that? There are shorter time frames around reviewing this and getting it back to the nurse than there are with incident-based. So and this is one of the, uh, what's on the screen now is one of the premises that I like to and get across to people, especially when they're thinking about doing safe harbor peer review. The reason that the board allows you to invoke safe harbor um, up front and then go ahead and take the assignment is that patients are better off with a nurse than without a nurse in the vast majority of cases. So it's better for the patients to have a nurse in an understaffed situation than for the nurse just to leave the facility and say, I'm not taking that assignment. So that's the board's view. Does that make sense? Well, it depends. <laughs> you know, 
<laughs> so let's, let's use your scenario. If a labor nurse comes to work and there's only one labor nurse there, if there's no patients in the department, it might be okay for her to sit there and not have anything to do. So should, is, would it be good faith to invoke Safe Harbor Peer Review at that time? I, I, I don't, it depends. If you know patients are coming, maybe a different scenario. But it's so fact dependent. If you come in and there's no patients there and you're the only one that's assigned, you know, is there a supervisor who's anticipating that they're going to come help you during the shift if you get a patient? Or what are the other resources? So the context around the assignment is important. If, remember that the, the assignment changes during the shift and you didn't declare safe harbor at the beginning, if the assignment changes, you can declare safe harbor when the assignment changes. So if you get a patient or two patients, you can declare, declare safe harbor subsequent to taking the assignment if the assignment changes. Does that make sense? Any other, uh, Janet? This is one of my pieces of paper. I don't know how much I can Janet feels strongly about this. <laughs> When this first came out, for some reason, across the hospital, people got the idea this was a way to get out of work. And it's never been uh, Some of the situations that I've seen nurses put in, they should have been both safe harbor. We do not take a nurse off of one unit to be a charge nurse on another unit when she absolutely knows nothing about those patients. For example, you don't take a postpartum nurse to work in a in when she's never taken a fetal heart tone in her entire life. She's never worked in a part. Yet, if she had invoked Safe Harbor, then the COA would have come down here and found out there was another nurse on the postpartum unit who used to work L&D. The right nurse could have been sent to the right unit. And without that communication, you're then putting your patients at risk. We look at our acuity and we look at our numbers, but we also have to look at the skills and the knowledge and the competence of the nurse. And also, if you're 217 11 or 217 12, there's a statement about the charge nurse that the charge nurse must assign patients based upon their knowledge, their skills, their experience, and their competency. So if, we, if an assessment was done, at the end of one shift before the next shift. I think we could cut out a lot of the situations that might lead us to wanting to go to that part to begin with. It keeps you from assigning geographically, which sometimes can be harder. But I think nurses need to be aware that this really is safety first of all for the patient. We've got the right nurses in the right spot with the right patients, the right experience, the right knowledge. But if it happens if you can't make that switch, like we've had happen, uh, and something does happen, at least you're not going to be supportive. Thanks, Janet. I, I can't, for those of you who did not hear what Janet had to say, I, I don't think I can summarize it all, and I can't project the passion that Janet has about it, which is um, admirable. Uh, but she really tried to emphasize um, this idea that the idea is that patients are better off with a nurse than without a nurse in the vast majority of cases. And this is about patient safety as it is, as much as it is about protecting the nurse, and that um, there are situations. Um, that arise that communication can make a great difference in when sometimes the correct communication doesn't go on. And she mentioned a part of the um, either the unprofessional conduct rules or um, the scope of practice where it talks about the charge nurse needing to ass assign nurses based on skill and competence. Um, so thanks for adding that, Janet. I think I got most of it uh, in my little summary for those of you who could not hear what she had to say. Um, and in every instance where Safe Harbor is invoked, it does stimulate conversation, and that's another good outcome of invoking Safe Harbor. Um, I learned a long time ago when I was, um, we didn't call them COAs, but when I was a nurse administrator at night, that if a nurse has an objection to something, that I probably better listen to what they're saying. Um, and I, I need to go back and Oh, yeah, I see your, 
you're objecting, I better listen here. So it always stimulates conversation. Any clinical operations administrator comments about Safe Harbor or what you see? No? Okay. They're often at the uh, tip. I'm it to you. <laughs> what? I'm it to you. Oh, thanks, Pat. <laughs> Scott told me you did that. Yeah. Just one, one thing. Safe Harbor does not allow us to do less than very safe, very competent care. Care may be slower. Care may be delayed. We still do the five rights of medication or the six rights of medication administration. We still do the safety things that are put in place for us. So that's a perfect lead into this next slide, and that's um, this rule that a nurse under safe harbor can engage in an assignment or requested conduct unless that requested assignment or conduct would constitute a criminal act. You can't declare safe harbor and be protected for, from a criminal act. You can't declare a safe harbor um, and go out and act unprofessionally or do unprofessional conduct. You can't declare a safe harbor when you lack the basic knowledge, skills, and abilities necessary to deliver nursing care that's safe and meets the minimum standards of care to the extent that accepting the assignment would expose one or more patients to an unjustifiable risk of harm. That's what Pat was just saying. You, can't, you still have to go by commonly accepted standards and you can't engage in unprofessional conduct or criminal conduct under safe harbor and not um, think that you're going to be subject to action by the board. Disciplinary action. So the Texas Administrative Code um, under Section 217.11, Standards of Nursing Practice, um, sets forth the following. The standards of practice establish a minimum acceptable level of nursing practice in any setting for each level of nursing licensure or advanced practice authorization. Failure to meet these standards may result in action against the nurse's license even if no actual patient injury resulted. That's really important and I probably should have underlined it. Even if no actual patient injury resulted. So these standards are applicable to all nurses, all vocational nurses, registered nurses, and registered nurses with advanced practice authorization shall, and um, you can go on the website and see what they shall do. Um, <laughs> standard specific to vocational nurses, standard specific to registered nurses, standard specific to registered nurses with advanced practice authorization. Professional, unprofessional conduct, the uh, 217.12 rule. Unprofessional conduct rules are intended to protect patients or clients and the public from incompetent, unethical, or illegal conduct of licensees. These rules' um, purpose is really to identify those unprofessional or dishonorable behaviors of a nurse which the board believes are likely to deceive, defraud, or injure clients or the public. So when Carla asked earlier what would the board look for when they're determining uh, good professional character, here's another hint at what they would look at if the nurse's intent was to deceive, defraud, or injure clients. They certainly would probably find that was not good professional character. And then, again, with the emphasis here, as it was in the prior rule, actual injury to a client need not be established. So the Board of Nursing gets more than 16,000 complaints a year. So how many nurses did I say there were in licensed in Texas? 300 and something thousand. So 16,000 complaints. Not all the complaints um, end up in resulting in an investigation or disciplinary action by the board, of course. But in all um, cases, the identity of the complainant, whoever files the complaint, is kept confidential. Uh, the nurse gets notified that an investigation about their practice is underway, and they're invited to respond. I think what I hear from the board is that many nurses choose not to respond or ignore the request from the board. And that's probably the biggest um, blow to most nurses when the board is investigating them is they don't take that opportunity to respond to the notice from the board. One, either because they haven't updated their address and the board couldn't find them, or two, they just ignore the letter that they get. Then the investigator gathers and reviews the evidence and reviews any response that the nurse might have um, sent in. 
then a decision gets made by the board. The board um, has these responsibilities, and, or a nurse has these responsibilities during an investigation. One, to respond promptly to all requests for information by the investigator that's been assigned to your case. Two, to ask the investigator questions so you're certain that you understand what's happening. I, I think Zena's comments re really went along with this. You have to be your own best advocate. Um, keep the investigator informed about when, how, and where you can be reached and supply a phone number. Again, respond promptly to the notice letter informing you of the allegations against you. Um, your response should be concise, it should be clearly written, and it should address the facts as you know them. So the, what disciplinary action can the board uh, dole out? They can deny an individual's application for a license, for license renewal, or for a temporary permit. They can issue a written warning. They can issue a public reprimand. They can restrict or limit uh, the person's license, like uh, limiting one or more specified nursing activities. They can suspend the license. Um, back on the limiting specified nursing activities, we can, we've seen uh, board um, orders that restrict nurses from not serving as charge nurse, from not administering narcotics, different things. You can imagine the scenarios that those are related to, but different things like that, they can limit a nurse's practice. Not practicing on a night shift uh, sometimes has been a restriction that we've seen. So they can suspend a license, they can revoke a license, and they can assess a fine. Um, they can ask the nurse to submit to care, counseling, or treatment designated by the board. They can ask the nurse to participate in a program of education or counseling, including remedial education. We see that in almost every board order that comes back as a um, remedial education, either a specific um, area or um, before the nursing jurisprudence and ethics was required of everyone, they would require that nurses take a nursing jurisprudence and ethics course. They can um, ask that a nurse practice for a specified period of time under the direction of an RN or a vocational nurse designated by the board. They can uh, ask the nurse to perform public service that the board considers appropriate. And they can ask that the nurse abstain from the consumption of alcohol or the use of drugs and submit to random periodic drug screens. The board can accept the voluntary surrender of a license. Sometimes you'll see that in that uh, thing that comes out quarterly and you open it to the centerfold and look for your name and then look for your friends' names or people who aren't your friends' names. <laughs> and uh, sometimes you'll see in there that somebody surrendered their license. And you always wonder, what, what did they do that they gave up their license that they worked so hard to get? Um, they can place a pr um, probationary status on a license. They can order a licensee to pay a refund to a consumer. They can issue an emergency cease and desist order, and they can enjoin a violation of the Nurse Practice Act or a board rule. Cases that um, result in disciplinary action become public information. So once the disciplinary action has um, been taken, that becomes public information. And I think now you can go into the website and when you look up someone's license, if there's disciplinary action, you can see it. You can click on the order and usually read the order um, as to specifically what um, action the board took. And you know what? It didn't take two hours. Thank you very much. Any? I have a question. Yes. It's been bothering me ever since you told me about the nurse about um, license was taken out because she did not take care of the patient in the emergency room. What did you do on that doctor? I don't know. That wasn't part of the case. <laughs> it was the it was the board of nurse uh, examiners taking action against the nurse. I don't I don't know what happened in that situation. So remember, all the information is on the board of nurse examiners website. It's a great resource. UTMB Health, working together to work wonders.